So I've been pitching investors and talking to partners and things like that for the past few months. And a lot of that is about your business model and your market penetration and your market opportunities. And uh, that stuff is all really fun to me, but it's not as fun as the stuff we're about to talk about. And I think the stuff that a lot of you guys are probably more interested in. So we're going to talk about three things today. First of all, some problems with society. Second of all, how we can solve them using this crystal platform. And third of all, a new type of society that you could build out of that stuff. So this is going to be crazy and wild and really fun for me. Uh, but it's the stuff that keeps me up at night and I think you guys will enjoy it. So when we talk about systemic problems with how things are set up right now, there's two things that immediately jump out at me. So the first of all is this idea of measuring, uh, using money as a measurement and not as something which, with which to buy value or happiness or excitement. It's just a scorecard. And that's a big problem. And the other problem is just human irrationalities and biases. And even if we know what we're really optimizing for, we're just not good at making great decisions. So when we talk about the money problems, there's, there's two quotes that come to mind. And the first one is one by William Bruce Cameron. Not everything that can be counted counts. Not everything that counts can be counted. And if you think about that, it's actually pretty profound. It means that you can't measure everything that you're really trying uh, to optimize for. You, you just, right now, it's really hard or really expensive to do that measurement. And some of the things that are really easy to measure might not be what you actually want to optimize for. And then what Peter Drucker says is what gets measured gets managed. And when you put these two things together, what you see is that in society, the things that really matter are not the things right now that companies are working for. It might be easy to measure money, but again, money is not the end goal. Money is used to buy happiness for people and used to create uh, value for people. It's not just a scorecard, which is how it's being treated right now. So if you could bring down the cost of measurement and make it easy to measure things like environmental impact or things like that, I think that you're going to start seeing companies optimizing for those things because happiness, you can really only buy happiness up to about seventy dollars to $90,000 per year. After that, the money doesn't do anything. So what these people who are, who are making you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, what they're doing is treating money as a scorecard. And if we can create a different scoring system, you might be able to create, uh, avoid things like Enron, things like that. If you can create a new scoring system that takes into account all the things we really want to optimize for, then you're going to start seeing companies optimize for those things. And that's all well and good, except that humans aren't the best at optimizing for things. So have you ever had to rush to leave the house because you didn't leave enough time to get ready? Raise your hand if, that, if you've ever done that. If you ever underestimated the cost of any project you've been doing, whether that's remodeling, et cetera, raise your hand. Have you ever spent more time writing an email or doing anything than you thought you would because you just planned wrong? Raise your hand if you've ever done that. All of these are systemic human biases. And that means that even if we come up with the right measure for what we're optimizing for, we're still not going to be that good at following through with it. We're not going to make the ideal decisions because humans are just kind of this kludge of evolutionary things that's great in the ancestral environment, but we're not good at planning to write emails. Uh, that's just the fact of it. So again, if you can create the ideal decision-making system combined with the ideal measurement system, you can start to get the things that really matter. So when we talk about making good decisions, there's three aspects of that. There's goals, 
each of those goals, there are options to try and achieve those goals, and then those options lead to outcomes. And this comes from decision theory. So the goals are encoded in what's called a utility function. And a utility function is basically just a mathematical formula that spits out a number. The higher the number, the closer to your goals you are. So you can imagine a utility function encoding things like happiness, like healthiness, uh, like profit. All of those things would go into the utility function, be weighed against each other, and the utility function would spit out a number. Uh, then you have options. You can imagine if you were, say, your goal was to um, move to a new city. And you have this utility function that, that weighs the different, uh, the different things you care about. Then you might have a number of cities you move to. And within those cities, you might have a number of different houses you're looking at. And depending on what city you move to and what houses you move to, you might have different opportunities, which would lead to different outcomes. So what decision theory tells us, which humans are really bad at, is that we should multiply the probability of a certain, thing, of a certain outcome happening by the outcome, how good that outcome is, and that leads to the ultimate, um, that's the score. That's how much uh, we want to do the decision. So the highest score there is the options that we should take. And again, humans are really bad at this, but there are some humans that are really good at this, like Elon Musk. This is why he created Tesla. This is why he created SpaceX. It's because he thought in this way. So wouldn't it be great if instead of just having these outliers like Elon Musk, who are just weird people who think like this, we could create systems for businesses, for governments that automatically thought like this, that automatically would take those long shots if they had a great chance of success. And that's what we're trying to build here. And when you think about that, and especially in the Ethereum landscape, you might think of Augur, which is a prediction market. And for those of you who don't know what a prediction market is, a prediction market is a way to bet on the likelihood of an event happening. So. You could bet, uh, yes, there will be an earthquake in the next six months, or no, there will not be. And then the more people who bet yes, the higher those odds get and the more it costs. So at any given time, the odds in the prediction market are the same thing as the odds that the crowd thinks that event is going to occur. Pretty cool idea. And Augur uh, is actually split into two different... Um, Categories. So there's the lost my train of thought here. Give me a second. So Augur is split into two different categories. The first category is its reputation metric. The reputation metric is can be thought of like a decentralized measurement system. It's based on the fact that if two people are measuring things and they're telling the truth, they're probably going to get the same number. And so if they both put in the same number, those, the reputation is going to flow to those people. And they're more likely to be, give that same number in the future. So that's a pretty cool idea because, again, if you can measure things that previously couldn't be measured, then people are going to start optimizing for things that they previously didn't optimize for. That's awesome. And the other side of Augur is, again, the prediction market. And when I first found out about prediction markets for a long time, I was like, all right, this is everything I need. This gives me the probabilities. This gives me the outcomes. This is great. But there's a few problems with prediction markets that ultimately led me to not want to use them. So the first thing is that this just moves the problem a layer down. So how a prediction market works is that I bet some money, and you bet against me, and then I lose the money, and you win the money. There's no exchange of value there. Nobody's getting something, selling anything to something else. It's a zero-sum game. And if it's a zero-sum game, all you're doing is getting back to the problem of money as a scorecard instead of as a way to get value. So you're just moving that problem that I'm trying to fix with the system a layer down in the system. So that was the first problem. And the other problem is that if you're betting against somebody who knows more than you in prediction market, you're inherently being irrational. 
And so historically, prediction markets have done really well in places like sports, in places like politics, where people have their identity wrapped up in it and they're willing to be a little irrational. Uh, but they haven't done well other places. So again, you're just moving that problem irras irrationality that we're trying to get rid of just a layer down in the system. There's two other problems with prediction markets that make them not good for the purposes of crowdsourcing decisions. So the first idea is this idea of uh, transaction costs and liquidity. So in a prediction market, there's basically two ways to do it. One is what I've been talking about, people directly betting against each other. The other way is if there's not enough people to bet because it's not something that their identity is wrapped up in, then the company can come in and say, hey, I'm going to pay $1,000 to find out this information, and I'll just take the bad side of every bet. Of every other bet, I'll take the other side. So the problem there is that if the money it takes the company to create that liquidity, to, to bring in the experts, is less than the value of the information that they're going to get from that prediction market, that prediction will never happen. That will never get put on the market. So for really small questions like, oh, should we hire this person? How much value is this person going to add to a company? Um, how many lives will, uh, you know, will this drug save? Maybe that's a bigger one. But for a lot of those questions, you simply, don't, uh, you simply won't get that. That equation won't work out, and that question will never happen. So for, if you want to outsource all of these types of decisions, uh, you can't do it to a prediction market. And the final thing that prediction markets are really bad at is counterfactuals. So a counterfactual is saying, on the other hand, what if I did this? And if you're doing a strategy where you have five levels down, where you say, well, if I do this, then I'll do this, then I'll do this, then I'll do this, that's really important for strategic planning. But a prediction market simply will not do that because the only way that you get paid by a prediction market is if that final fifth thing actually happens. And because there's five other things before it, it's unlikely to happen. People are unlikely to bet on it, and you won't get the information. So I looked at these problems, and I thought, is there a better way? Is there a way that we can get people to not only bet on the probability of just an options, but get people to suggest different options? And is there a way that we can get the probability of those outcomes occurring without running into these problems? And the answer is yes. So Crystal runs on two metrics. The first metric is creativity. And creativity can be thought of uh, as, again, going back to those goals. How well do your suggestions meet those goals? So if you wanted to uh, say, you know, where should I move next year uh, that will balance my happiness and my income, then you would give some information about yourself. And these creativity people would actually suggest places that would work out well for you. And if those places ended up meeting your criteria, they would get more creativity. The people who suggested bad suggestions would end up getting less creativity. And the creativity uh, and those people would then be raised over time. That's the first part of it. How do you get the suggestions? Now, how do you actually um, figure out numerically what is the probability of each of these outcomes to, for instance, increase your happiness or increase your income? So here's how that works. This is called a prediction poll. It's been used by uh, IARPA, which is a, a government agency. And using this same technology, they were able to beat um, CIA analysts by 30% with just the wisdom of the crowd. So this is pretty established technology. So let's say this guy's putting out a new drug and he's already gotten suggestions from the crowd and one of this drug is called Marisol. And he's saying, what are the chances of saving over 500 million lives in the next five years? Then experts from all over the world who have proven that they're good at predicting pharmaceutical questions would come and say, hey, I'm willing to make a prediction. The system then takes their previous predictions and expertise and creates a number, which is not showing up, um, but it, which in this case is 70%. At that point, 
the coins get redistributed based on who did well and who did poorly, and the money gets redistributed accordingly. The money at the end is what makes this not zero sum. The company is paying directly for the information that it wants instead of people betting against each other. So what can you do with this technology? What can you do when you can actually outsource decisions and measure the immeasurable? I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about how companies could outsource their entire strategies. I'm going to talk about new types of organizations this would enable. And I'm going to talk about uh, how an entire society could be built around this type of technology. So let's talk about crowdsourcing your entire strategy. Again, when you can bring down the cost of what you measure, and you can put, say, your key performance indicators into this platform, and then you can say, hey, what is the best action we can take to make those key performance indicators perform? You don't need a strategist at that point. You don't need a CEO because the crowd is doing everything for you. So you can imagine these lean organizations which only have people um, executing, and the strategy is completely outsourced to the crowd. And that in itself is pretty amazing. But what gets even more amazing is that once you have these lean organizations, how do you actually set the goals? How do you set those key performance indicators? And once you get rid of the, that upper management that's doing the strategy, you can just give the, the way to set the goals to the, you could say, hey, half of it goes to the employees and half of it goes to the customers. At that point, they put in what they care about. Do they care about the environment? Do they just care about getting cheap products? And the organization, again, the system, will do the best to optimize for those goals. So at that point, you eliminate moral hazards because you're not having people who aren't involved with a product making decisions for those people. The people who are involved directly with the product are making the decisions about what they care about. And again, that could be completely transformative to society. But where you get even crazier, even more of a disruption, is when you imagine, what if you could do this for government? What if you could get the values of every individual in a society and try and optimize for that? You could imagine if you had a company that was run under this thing, and they had their own utility function, and you had a government that had their own utility function, and you took the difference between what the government was and what the company was, there's your taxation right there. You take those taxes and you put them towards nonprofits or new businesses that are predicted to make up that difference, and right there you've just eliminated externalities. So again, I'm really excited about this stuff. Um, if you want to know more about the system and the, the business uh, side of this, I am absolutely happy to talk to that. Uh, my email is right here. Oh, 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 I forgot one slide. Why did I use Ethereum? Why does any of this need Ethereum? And, yeah. And there are lots of, um, there are lots of strategic reasons why you might want to do this. Um, but I'm not going to get into those. I wrote a cool blog post on that. Uh, it's on my website if you want to look at it. But in terms of the stuff I want to talk about today, Let's talk about the weakest link in the chain. If you're building a government or an entire business, and this is the foundational layer, you need to know that the foundational layer is going to last at least as long as whatever you want to build. And if you're building a government, you want that to be at least like uh, 200 years. 200 years is a good, good length for a government. And so a company, just a, a plain company that's running the software, you can't trust that. But if Ethereum becomes what we all think it will be, and what, what we all uh, hope it will be, then this could be something that you actually have the faith in to last 200 years. So that's all. Um, my Twitter is Matt Goldenberg. You feel free to ask questions. My email is matt at lifeofmatt.net. And uh, my website is mattgoldenberg.net. So uh, please don't hesitate to ask me any questions and get in touch. Um, how are we doing on time, Ryan? Do we have time for questions? Uh, yeah, you should, you should be able to get some questions in. Okay.
and if you're if there's anybody who happens to be watching online, feel free to at Matt Goldenberg your question, and I'll uh, I'll look at it. Any questions? I have a microphone. <laughs> How's this going to work in a capitalist society where intellectual property is pretty much what we rely on as a means of survival? Okay. Um, yeah. So this doesn't have it doesn't have anything to say about intellectual property. Um, this is more about the decisions. Uh, this is more about uh, you know getting uh, decisions, making decisions for people that optimize what they really care about. And if that decision, if um, intellectual property is something that's needed to optimize what people really care about, then this would say yes, include intellectual property. Was that does that get at your question or? I guess I mean who would want. I, I who would want to provide that information available to the public, I guess is what I'm okay. Yeah. Okay, so you're asking how do you, if you're creating a strategy for your company, how do you keep that from everybody else? Well, that's, that's what my intention would be. I mean, why, right. why would businesses want to share this information if, uh, if it's... Right, yeah. So, yeah. so there's a few ways we deal with uh, privacy. Um, and the, the easiest way is to uh, just have a, a private chain where you can pick some of these experts who are proven that they're experts, and they can, uh, they can predict on your private chain, and then after they're all done with that, those coins go back onto the public chain. Uh, that's one way. And then the other way to do it is to just have your private chain be in company, and uh, you, get, you get these experts in your company, and they can do that. So if you're worried about that privacy aspect, uh, we do have some some kind of stopgap solutions until the blockchain figures out how to do uh, how to do privacy. Yeah, Drew. I'm just curious if you've put any thought towards uh, people that can like impact future events that they might be predicting, or maybe uh, someone who might have something to gain from spreading misinformation to someone else, uh, I guess those types yeah. of attacks. Yeah, so um, definitely giving thought to both of those questions. Uh, so in terms of impacting uh, events in order to predict, in order, in order to predict them, um, in this case, uh, that you almost want that. Um, because uh, because the, the events you're predicting are based on your utility function, how much you care about things. Uh, so if, if somebody is, yeah, so if somebody is betting against you, you want that. Um, the other answer to that is that people on both sides are both going to be trying to do that. So it kind of cancels each other out. Um, there's, no, there's no more incentive for people to try and influence an event one way than the other way. So it, it ends up in a wash. Um, and then your second question, could you remind me? Um, I guess it was uh, people who would have a stake in spreading misinformation. Oh, so, so, have a stake. so the yeah, like yeah. the example I'm thinking about is oil companies would want to bet on predictions about like climate or something like that. Right. Yeah. So that's a um, that is a big problem. Um, if there are oil companies who are putting in their crystal coins to bet um, against. Uh, X proposition happening. That's going to incentivize people who know the right information to come in because they're going to be able to win a lot of crystal coins from that event. Um, so that's, uh, there, there is kind of, you know, if somebody ends up with a whole ton of coins, they can influence events, but they can only do it for uh, one, or two, one or two predictions before they start to lose all those coins and give it to the people who are actually predicting correctly. Greta, did you have a question back there? Okay. So in the model that you gave the question about uh, in a capitalist society, you actually had one that was decentralized as far as access to the public for knowledge, but it was a company that was going out to a decentralized source of experts mm -hmm. that they could select. Yeah. So in it you could deploy this technology where you select the people you're essentially outsourcing in yeah. order to get advice. Exactly. And exactly. Uh, if you're, I'm just thinking if, you're, if your customer was a different group rather than, you know, 
off with their heads for <laughs> the, cust- uh-huh. the, the CEOs, uh-huh. if you're actually briefing this to CEOs. I was thinking, I was imagining you could also brief them that, you know, this is an incredibly powerful tool to get a completely dispassionate group of consultants, not pitching mm-hmm. uh, to ensure that their, their consulting contract continues. Yeah. It is simply on the success of their idea, making their customer successful. They're actually simply competing on the quality of the creativity and the accuracy of their idea, which I think is an amazing idea. And then that they get rewarded almost instantly for every idea that is, yeah, for every idea that is a success, and they get essentially punished by not getting paid for an idea. So it's always the relevance Mm -hmm that gets rewarded rather than necessarily the reputation yeah. per se, although that occurs yeah, as well. I, I love that. And uh, one way to actually think about this platform, if you want to think about it from a business perspective, uh, which is where Greta was coming at it, from disintermediating uh, like management consultants, is that what Airbnb did to hotels, we're doing to management consulting. We're allowing anybody to come in and be management consulting and you can see the rating of exactly how well they did right there. All right, uh, thanks guys. I'm gonna let Ryan go now, but oh. oh. So, so how do you deal with um, situations where the events are gonna take some time to play out and um, say, you know, especially in strategy over big questions that may mm-hmm. be a year or two before your drug goes mm-hmm. through trials and actually gets to market, et cetera? Yeah. Um, so the, the good thing is that um, the, peop- the participants don't have any money uh, wrapped up in this. So they can, they can change their uh, bets at any time, unlike a prediction market where they need somebody on the other side. They can change their predictions at any time, and they're incentivized to do that because, again, the more accurate they are, the more coins they get, the more money they get. Um, so you don't end up with uh, what prediction markets have where you have money in and then you somehow need to pull it out because you need it for something. Um, the businesses do need to keep their money in right now, Um, We don't have any sort of IOU, it's in escrow. Um, But hopefully the value of information is such that they're willing to do that to get that information back. All right, thanks guys. Thank you.